how come you didn't start your own brokerage or that's something down the road you consider? It's something down the road I consider to start catching pennies, but it, it costs a lot to, to have your own broker. I've been asked that question a lot. Uh, with your success, why not start your own black brokerage? Mm -hmm. And what I said is Keller Williams is a huge name. Don't pigeonhole just Put yourself in a box, man. Don't put myself in a box Something and lose box. all the resources lose that you get. That I have. And it's really screwed up for black businesses oh, like it that is because you don't want to be the black realtor. Mm -hmm. Because if you become the black brokerage, you won't get nothing but the black business. Yeah. That's all you'll get because people will say, oh, that's the black brokers. You mm -hmm. run out there and that's what it's saying. And fine, you'll say, well, let me just take the black business. But right. you don't want that because nobody else do that. White folks don't say I'm the white broker, right. you, you know? It, you hit it you, right on it, the head. And it's messed up that we have to be like that. And, and the sad thing about it, I've had people tell me, like as my circle started expanding, mm -hmm. I've had interviews and went on listing appointments, affluent black people in the communities like, well, I didn't know a black realtor could handle a sale of this magnitude. Oh, that no, I don't even give me start. And I'm like, hold on, what you, what you say? Like, right, what, right. what's the difference between this house? Right. Yeah, it's a right. little bit more. Yeah. But it's all paperwork. It's all paperwork. <laughs>what's up what's up everybody welcome to another episode of strategic moves i'm your host ken dow this is a place where we bring art culture politics and business all together and we do it every sunday right here on this channel and today we're going to talk a little bit about business business development and i got a gentleman in here my daughter said it's a rainmaker never heard that term before rainmaker I'm like girl what is a rainmaker she said this guy makes so much money in real estate that he makes it rain in the real estate house. I said, really? He said, it's raining over there. We met, we all grew up together. Like most friend groups, these guys have been giving each other a hard time since they can remember. I think I think Rich knew each other first, personally. But those nah, me and Jamie knew each other first. We was I, in I high knew school. Rich since kindergarten. I knew, Will, yeah, we was, me and Will went to kindergarten. We was in preschool together. We was in preschool together. Well, right. kindergarten, preschool. Yeah. But Richard Singleton, Will Levy, Jamie and Barry, and Jermaine Brooks are more than just friends. They're business partners. We were all talking, doing our own business ventures in real estate, learning and, and developing and making a few dollars. But when we came together, we were making a bigger impact together. And if all goes well, the impact of their company, WRJ Developers, will be massive. They plan on completely transforming this space on East 72nd Street, north of St. Clair, on Cleveland's east side, into not only an apartment complex. This is something edgy and different. But 64 apartments, all made out of, get this, shipping containers. Everything they're doing on the west side you know, we want to try to do it on the east side, but we want to make it, we want to try to make it affordable and not push people out of the community. This community is their community. It's where they met and grew up and they want to take care of it. We had to give back to the culture and, and kind of bring in something nice to this area uh, that's being forgotten about and try not to push our people out. They've gotten pretty far along on the project. They've hired a container company and most of their designs have been approved. Now they're working to fund the project while bringing their own skills to the table. The man brings this real estate hat, the agent hat. Will and I have an engineer background, so we bring that that technical side to it as well. And I definitely have some experience. We all have construction experience, which is great. So we just have a nice mix. Rich is the financial guy. So it's just like a nice blend. Of, of, of skill sets that works that works well. They're hoping this project resonates with the place and people they love so much. We're bringing a nice product to the city um, that we that the city can be proud of and, and trying to build a legacy here that especially on the east side of town. Amanda Van Allen, News 5. So everybody, I would like y'all to welcome Mr. Jermaine Brooks to our program. Mr. Brooks. How you doing? Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, brother. So, Mr. Brooks, yes. as I opened the program, they talked about you are a real estate broker and a real estate developer here. You have a lot of different things going on. Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, well, I am a real estate agent, and mm -hmm. it's funny you say a rainmaker. Never refer to myself as that team lead, okay. but I do have a team, list sell by team. Okay. And we have 15 agents underneath me, in which I instruct on doing deals and everything like that. Wow. So, in the real estate world, they call it the rainmaker. Oh, that's what so, she yeah. said. She, she told me she said. 
said, you know, you are a rain. He's a rainmaker. And yeah, I, I said, but oh. it, it's the stressful part because now I'm dep- everybody depending on me to make sure they make some money. Really? Yeah. So I help and mentor and everything like that. And I got into that years ago. I got my real estate license in 2014. Okay. But from the private side, mm-hmm. I was doing my own little flips, renovations and things like mm-hmm. that. When it was time for my brother and our partners to mm-hmm. sell, Mm-hmm. Uh, at that point, I went and got my license. Okay. I said, we need to keep the money with me. And when I got my license, and then that's when the business just took off. So let's go back a little bit, man. Are you, we got to get in your for a little bit, man. <laughs> okay. Are you from Cleveland? Yep. Born from- and raised. Cleveland, uh, Warrensville Heights High School. Warrensville Heights High School. Yep. Came out in 1993. Okay. Yeah, so we always used to kid. Heights used to be the thing, but we were the real tigers. So oh, yeah. well, you know, we that's where our neighborhood. We we heights tigers. Oh, okay. You know, it's a little battle. Yeah, you right. guys are the tigers over there. I don't yeah. know, but one's the cubs and one's the tiger. You know, <laughs> as they say. Yeah, we got we got to think about the time frame. So in the nineties, I played mm-hmm. football there. Okay, wrestled, track, uh-huh. baseball. And then from there, I went to Allegheny College. Okay. Played football at Allegheny for two years. Okay. And then a good friend and a mentor of mine, Stanley Drayton. Okay. He went to John Marshall. They used to call him the Bottle Rocket. Okay. But he's coaching at Temple now. Okay. He had left Allegheny and went to Eastern Michigan. Mm-hmm. And he was just like, Jermaine, you need to be at a D1 school. You oh. can play. You can okay. play here. What position was you playing? I played outside linebacker. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then I went up to Eastern for a trip. And I'm a capital too. So all okay. of us were capitals. We drove up there. And Earl Boykins was at Eastern. Okay. Yeah. Good friend of mine. Okay. And he was like, man, you should come up here. You should come up here. Mm-hmm. And I just embraced it. Okay. I got up there. Coach Cooper was the head coach at Eastern then. And mm-hmm. he was a capital. Okay. So I had Stan and Coach Cooper saying, we got you. We got you. Mm-hmm. Transfer from Allegheny. Got up there. Both of them left. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I had to walk on. But I ended up getting my scholarship. Came out of Eastern Michigan in 97. Okay. I was the defensive captain up there. Charlie Batch was our quarterback. Okay. So he was the offensive captain. So after that, did the whole, you know, travel around the NFL. Got cut multiple times didn't ever make a team mm-hmm. but it was fun the experience has taught me that, a lot that's really interesting man do you, do you know mark harris yep everybody he was on my show yesterday oh really so, yeah, yeah everybody who ever played football then went through mark harris somewhere yeah. or another that yeah kind of he was younger than me he was more my brother's age really yeah it's funny when you talk about cleveland sports everybody remembers me from warrensville but my brother I made him transfer. So my brother graduated from Ignatius. Okay, who's your brother? Jason played at Ignatius. That's when they were hot. I think they won like three state championships. They were Mm. ranked in the nation every year. Okay. But we had two different paths. Okay, okay. Uh, And it was something that I realized early on Mm -hmm. when I was in high school because at Warrensville, we didn't have as much support. Okay. We didn't have the scouts there. We were independent back in 93. Right. So we never made the playoffs, really, even though we Mm -hmm. had great talent, great skills, Mm -hmm. and everything like that. We didn't believe in stats. We had a whole bunch of nonsense going on. But then he went to Ignatius and got everything. And got religion. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's always been like that with Mm -hmm. Warrensville schools. Oh, yeah. I mean, with all the sports, you know, my daughter played softball for Cleveland Heights. Mm -hmm. and All of that. And I mean, we went to one game. I think it's about the second or third time they played them. Went to the game, man. I was looking at these girls, man. Their uniforms didn't okay. have no uniforms on, man. Right. It was all bad. It was just look. So I called the mayor. I called Brad and was like, man, uh-huh. you, can you get some uniforms for your girls' team? I was just like, you know, if you look bad, you play bad. And, right. and I don't know if they even had great uniforms that they would have played any better than they did, but at least they were out there trying. No, I mean, no, no, you're no, out no. there trying to play. The heist team was pretty good, so they was getting pounded, but yeah. they were just really – looking bad and i remember he came through and helped him out but imagine it was years and years of that Mm -hmm. before anybody was saying anything that they even did anything to that and the funny thing about it is i came out of warrensville in 93 Mm -hmm. i came back to cleveland 99 okay 2000 and Mm -hmm. then i went back and coached football wow with my head coach who coached me coach walker okay so i coached up there from 2000 to 2006 Okay. And then I tried to bring back some type of uh, pride okay. coming from where you come from. Okay. I was fortunate enough. I coached some wonderful guys. All mm-hmm. of them still call me coach to this day. Okay. I got like 16 or never in schools on scholarships. Mm-hmm. We were running a nice little program up there. Sound like you was true to that. That's, that's yeah, pretty good. Yeah. And I got many opportunities to go coach other places. Mm-hmm. And, I, and for some reason, just me being loyal. Uh-huh. I was like, if I'm a coach of high school, I'm going to my alma mater. I can't right. go nowhere. Right, that's right. Yeah, it was that's just right. me. Uh-huh. But uh, I had a blast. I still give back now because mm-hmm. uh, the football coaches now up at Warrensville, I coach them. Okay, okay. So now I go back as a whole full circle now. Right, right. No, that's good. <laughs> that's good. So you was talking and you said you ended up working at the city. 
Yeah, I was Mayor Jackson. Uh -huh. Story how I even got there. I was a social worker. Okay. Six nine six kids. Okay. Right, 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 <laughs> right by your office. Okay. <laughs> so I, I got nervous and my stomach started hurting when I was driving down here. That was a rough job. Hey, really. Yeah, that was a rough yeah. job. Yeah. Removing kids from yeah. harmful situations yeah. and things like that. And I lasted four and a half years there. Wow. At that point, me and my grandfather, Bob Ward, mm -hmm. uh, had a, a bar, restaurant, nightclub on 93rd and Nelson. Okay. So me and him went into business together. I tried the entrepreneurship thing. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I pivoted and went to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I had bought some investment properties. Okay. And then this is when all the mortgage stuff was going mm -hmm. on and mm -hmm. I was losing my properties. So my mom worked at the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. She was like, come down here. They got a program for minority developers and minority <laughs> <Right>. contractors. <laughs> and you can try to see if you can get some work. Mm -hmm. So I went down there, walked into the Office of Equal Opportunity, and it really opened my mind up. I had never heard of these programs and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I said, instead of me asking for the service, I want to get in here and figure out how it works. Right. Okay. And then at that point, I went down to civil service, <laughs> filled out the application, put the application in and everything like that. Wow. And they hired me. And what was you doing there then? I, I started off as a contract compliance officer. Mm -hmm. So I would monitor all the construction projects to make sure they met like the Fannie Lewis law for on yeah. projects, minority yeah. participation, mm -hmm. the 15%. I used to monitor the contracts to make sure they met that participation. Yeah, that, that's a really good position. Yeah, man. that's really and good. Yeah, from there, they put me into the certifications. Mm -hmm. So then I was doing certifications for small businesses and the small business development side of it. And the reason why I say that's a good position, it's a really good position for somebody who has an entrepreneurial spirit. Because if you're going to be there for, and you know that ultimately you might thinking about going mm -hmm. into business yourself, you definitely going to know where all the bodies are. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because when I walked in, like coming from an entrepreneurial side mm -hmm. and going to work and mm -hmm. having to be there right. 8 to 4.30, right. Right. I was like, I'm giving this three years. I ended up being there 13. Wow, wow. <laughs> Wow. But it really fell in love with mm -hmm. it. small businesses grow, the success stories I was able to be a part of. Okay. Then I transferred from the Office of Equal Opportunity out to the airport, working mm -hmm. with the concessionaires and things like that. And just to see some of the minority companies get into the airport was really like a success. So speaking on that, because uh -huh. we're here to talk about entrepreneurship and all kinds of business. How they're getting work at the airport, mm -hmm. it, how difficult is that for African-American business? Oh, it's extremely hard. Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard. Uh, Everything is stacked against you. Mm -hmm. uh, first, to even go out there to be a contractor, the cost to build and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think when I was there, it was like three hundred and fifty dollars mm -hmm. a square foot. Yes. So you're responsible for building out your little kiosk, and, and it's like you said, little kiosk. Little kiosk. <laughs> it's three hundred fifty dollars right. a square foot. Plus, right. you got to pay for all the permits exactly. and everything like that. So exactly. that's already a barrier for a lot of minority companies who already having capacity issues. They can have a great design, a great product, a great restaurant, this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And we started doing a lot of things like test kitchens out there. Mm. We had a small contractor, a small concession rotating program in mm -hmm. which we were doing things. We brought people out during the holidays to mm -hmm. sell their products inside the atrium. Mm -hmm. So we started doing things like that just to get the awareness out there. It's extremely hard business to get into. Now you say you bought the barbershop out there. Yeah, so the barbershop is uh, called Aircuts. Aircuts, okay. Yeah, so we brought that out there. The Flow Lounge. Okay. Still was with Larry Eskridge and them at Brugger's. Okay. He has Brugger's Bagels. Okay. Curtis English. Okay, uh, yeah. Curtis, you know, Curtis English been yeah, out there forever. I, when, that, now, that's the name I remember when yes. I was telling you what I was doing. Curtis mm -hmm. English. And he has a lot of businesses out and there. He, and he's evolved. Yeah. He's understood how he... Yeah. He's evolve. a good dude. Yeah. You know, that's a guy. I remember that one. Mm -hmm. Kennedy, let's write that Curtis English down. Yeah, he's a good guy to bring in and, and definitely have a and, talk and with. He, yeah. he helped me out when I got there. Yeah. Just understanding the history. Correct. All the struggles that he had. Exactly. Through, exactly. Just to be there and just to mm -hmm. assist, open mm -hmm. the doors up for others to come yep. in. Yeah. Yeah. And then I used to always bring Curtis in. Any company yeah. I bought in there, you yeah. got to talk to Curtis. You got to talk to Curtis. Gotta, he's a really good guy. He helped yeah. me a lot when I was out there doing that stuff with BAA. And then on the construction side of mm -hmm. it, that's still hard to do business out there, even okay. though there's goals attached. Mm -hmm. Got to be disadvantaged business certified first mm -hmm. obstacle. Mm -hmm. Certification is hard to get. Yes, it is. And then the second thing is you got to have all the insurance qualifications, mm -hmm. two, three million dollars worth of liability, mm -hmm. then the bonding for that, that small business for the spec of work that they're doing. So, you know, all of those different obstacles. And the leasing. Oh. Is a trip because don't you have to make a certain revenue? Yeah. It's revenue based. Your lease yeah, is revenue. based off of revenue. It's based, not just yep. lease is based off the revenue as well. Wow. So yeah, I mean, but it's a heck of a career to get into. Mm -hmm. And 
I was fortunate when I was out there, Ricky Smith, who's now at BWI, Okay, he was there and he was big on like professional development and things like that. Mm -hmm. So he introduced us to Airport Minority Advisory Council. Okay. And we got to travel once a year to their big conference. Okay. Where you meet all the minorities with own concessions and programs and things like that throughout the United States. Okay. And then you get to see and rub your elbows with like millionaires. Wow. Like who've made it in the industry, in multiple locations. Mm -hmm. So once you see that, it can be done. It can be done. Right. Right. And then what our whole job was to bring that, those concepts back. How did they get in the Denver airport? How mm -hmm. did they get in the LAX? And then bring those concepts back to the uh, city of Cleveland. So it was, it was great work. Mm -hmm. It just got to a point where it was time for me. You know, it, mm -hmm. it was time for me to take that leap of faith and go on my own as far as the entrepreneur. So was that leap of faith, I want to go into real estate or did you do something else before you got into real estate? Yeah, it was definitely real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing real estate part-time okay. all the time while I was, well, I got my license at 14. Mm -hmm. So I was doing real estate part-time. Mm -hmm. So I was just a constant grind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Work eight to four thirty. Right. Get off at four thirty. Then I'm real estate until wee hours of the morning. You remember your first house you sold? Yes, I do. What was it? And it was so funny. It was on the west side of West 101st. Mm -hmm. It was a, a Indian family. Mm. Right. They called me. I was on the couch. Uh, the Cleveland Browns play on Sunday, and they called me. Said that they found my number. I don't know how they found the number. They wanted <laughs> to look at a house off West 101st, <laughs> and I said, now. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they were like, yo, we, we need to see it now. Right. We need to see it now. And I got up, drove over there. First time I met them, everything like that. Didn't know exactly what I was doing. Opened the door. They fell in love with it. I got the pre-approval, put the offer in. It got accepted. And that was my first deal. Now, isn't it funny? I don't know about you, but you can let me know how that deal just happened. Like you said, out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And you got that person you've been working with for months. <laughs> <laughs> Going through all kinds of hoops and loops for them and just can't seem to close that deal. Yeah. And like you say, you be sitting at home one day and the phone ring out right. of the blue, mm -hmm. a stranger calls, no connection to, yeah. and the deal goes just like that. Yeah, that's it's funny because I got my license to start selling off me, my brother, and our partner's portfolio. Mm -hmm. And they were the hardest people to work with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what it is. Right? They, they was the hardest. We had a couple listings uh -huh. and we were getting offers in. No, nah, mm -hmm. that's not enough. No, right. that's not enough. Right. No counter. We're too right. far apart. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I get that one call that came in. And they was everything. just so happy. Like, right. We're glad you came. <laughs> like, how many people y'all call? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that, that was the first one. Uh -huh. I'll I never forget it. And, and so after that, you got into just doing real estate or you yeah. Yeah, right. was so, you guys selling, buying and selling or you was just really just selling yeah. real estate at first? Yeah. Right? So I started on the private side. So we started building a portfolio in which we purchased houses really low, mm -hmm. uh, renovated them. And then we just had renters coming in. OK, you're going to have to give a little tea. Uh, okay. you, you can't be called a rainmaker and don't tell us how you did it. <laughs> so everybody say that. You know, right. you ask, oh, yeah, man, I just got a little money together. We put mm -hmm. the money together. We want out. So it was you and your guys. It was you and your brothers. Yeah. So uh, and well, I think it was you and your childhood friends, right? Well, that's on the development side. OK. So it's been a progression. OK. We all start dibble dabbling in real estate, mm -hmm. like in the early 2000s. Uh, mm -hmm. I was one that was left holding the bag. So I say, mm -hmm. uh, bought five houses way in the inner city. Now, how did you buy them? On the stated loans. Huh, you got to tell us what that is. Yeah, so that's where that's when the mortgage crisis happened, when people <laughs> was buying, getting all, all, right. getting all the houses on stated loans. So okay. they had the adjustable interest rates and everything like that. Okay. So I bought five houses from a good friend of mine. who was like, you got to get into real estate. Mm -hmm. I took out five 80,000 plus mortgages mm -hmm. per house. And then everybody got paid and I was left with the tenant. With it, right. So I was just collecting rent, paying the mortgage, collecting rent, paying the so mortgage. So your partners, they just wanted to get the money from the top end and they let yeah. you have the property. Yeah. And that was all bad. That was all bad. That was all bad. <laughs> yeah, so that was my first mistake. What'd you uh, end up doing with the houses? I lost them. Oh, you ended up losing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's when the uh, mortgage crisis happened. Mm -hmm. Washington Mutual yeah. and all of those mm -hmm. companies had loans with all of them. Mm -hmm. They ended up taking the properties back. I had a uh, tax lien on my name for a while. Wow. Yeah. So I couldn't do anything in my personal. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I get a tax lien and I didn't even get the money. Right. That's why I said that was a real lesson. <laughs> that was a real lesson. Yeah. So I was going to ask you what was the worst experience you oh, had, yeah, that but was, that was I, it. I think you just gave it to yeah, me. Yeah. I got audited and everything. <laughs> oh, and yeah. That, like, yeah. You did. I get audited. Yeah. And all I did was, that was try to collect some. <laughs> Y'all raised the mortgage, but right. it was a learning experience. That was the worst. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a learning experience. So from there, 
my brother met some guys who had a hedge fund mm -hmm. and I had him knocking on doors in the Baltimore area, mm. cash for keys. So really? Pretty much what that is, is we own the house. We want you out. We'll give you $1,500 to move out. Yeah, they were doing a lot of that. Yep. Yeah, they, they were doing a lot of that. that. Yeah, they were. So my brother, yeah. he's not even from Baltimore area. And he's knocking on doors <laughs> in Baltimore. Right. But he was cool with it. I was like, Jason, you cool knocking on doors? He was like, yeah, man, it's pay good. But from there, I was like, they got anything in Cleveland? Mm -hmm. And from there, we got a whole little spreadsheet. So I was wholesaling before wholesaling even opened up. So did you have to pull your folks together? Because you coming out of bankruptcy, you coming yeah. out of all of that. So getting money and all that had oh, yeah. to be a pain. Yeah, was, so you was, had to start all the all, way. Up. All, I started from the ground. Okay. I mean, like, how they say started from the bottom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So once we got this list, mm -hmm. I looked at all the houses from like Detroit. Mm -hmm. I went to Easter, so I had ties up there. Mm -hmm. All the houses in Cleveland looking on the spreadsheet, it was like $250. Mm -hmm. They wanted $500 on top of whatever it was, so they wanted $750. Mm -hmm. so I was selling houses for three grand, making that. You that was getting it that quick. Yeah. They was getting them that low. Getting them that low. Wow. That low. And all I was doing was just middle man. Middle man. The, the wholesaler. <laughs> what they call right. it now. No, they call it wholesaler. Yeah, now. they call it wholesaler now. Okay. So I was doing that. Never had to put any money up, but that helped me build my capital. They helped you get started yeah. again. And then from there, the guys who owned the hedge fund owned the assets, seeing how quick we was getting rid of these houses in mm -hmm. Cleveland and Detroit. Mm -hmm. And they was like, hold on, who are these guys? And they flew to Cleveland. We met at a Heights title, Beverly Harris. Wow. At Heights title, one of the only black title companies. We met there. And it introduced them. And I was like, and if I had some money, I would be able to do this. This is the play. Mm -hmm. And from there, they believed in me and my brother. My brother ran the renovations. I went, located the properties, and then we got tenants in there. Mm. So we used their cash. Their cash. Their cash. Other people's money. Yep. Other mm -hmm. people's money. Mm -hmm. We used that to start building it up. They got up to over like 50 some properties. And then at that point, I was the only one working. I was the, the manager of mm -hmm. them, all the tenants. I got the mm -hmm. tenants in there mm -hmm. and they went elsewhere. My brother went to go flip houses on the West side. Wow. My other two partners, one went back to Israel. The other one went to California. He bought a weed farm. So he got a ticket. <laughs> well, he, 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 right. No, no, no. I'm saying yeah. when well, he went and made some money. Yeah, he went and made some money. <laughs> right. And then everybody else was like, just sell them. Just sell them. And mm -hmm. that's when I went and got my license. Okay. And you so, said, this is where I like. Yep. This is where yeah, I like. Yeah, because it was a point where I was like, who gets paid on every deal? Hmm. It was an agent and a general home inspector. And I thought I was too cool to be the general home inspector. Right. right. <laughs> well, and inspector. that's cool. And, and yeah. that's why I wanted you to break that down mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people that gloss over that. Yeah. And really, you told them, if people listening, you actually told them how it was done. And most of the people I know in real estate, that's exactly how they did it. Yeah. Most of the guys that I know that are extremely successful, mm -hmm. and that's exactly how they all did. pretty much started that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have the trust funds and go to mom and ask mm -hmm. for mom for this, that, and other. Mm -hmm. So we had to, you know, grow from having a plan and a vision that somebody had bought into and provided the funding. So how did you get into your business now is list, sale, yeah. buy? Yep. So the provision of real estate, what they call it. You get your sales license, you become a sales agent. Mm -hmm. Once you master the sales agent and your business has so much that you can't as one person handle it, mm -hmm. then you start farming it out get a buyer's agent and things like that. That's what the book says. Okay. Organically, what happened to me was <laughs> I was at Keller Williams. Mm -hmm. When I started in 14, there wasn't many black agents there. Correct. As the, the real estate market started getting better, we started getting more people in. Mm -hmm. But I kept seeing a lot of black agents walk out the door, get their license, not be successful. Because it costs a lot to have your license. Mm -hmm. Like the fees for a year. And if you haven't sold anything, you're going backwards. So I started seeing a lot of agents leave out get licensed, leave out, and be dejected with the industry. Mm -hmm. So I just started reaching out to him, saying, look, let's sit down. Let me show you what's working for me mm -hmm. and see what you can use to help your business grow. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was like four or five agents that I was working with. We were meeting up, just sharing ideas and things like that. And one of them, Cliff Lewis, he was like, man, you mm -hmm. start a team. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, because I was scared that once I started the team, then their success would be dependent on me. And I didn't want to handle that. So you got to tell mm -hmm. us who don't know in this. Right. What's the team? All right. So a real estate team is you get your rainmaker or your team lead. Okay. They start the team. And then from there, we have a transaction coordinator, admin, and then you start building a business. Really? Right. So all the agents then come underneath you and then they're all part of your team. So we, we share deals and things like that. 
as their production goes, the team makes money and then the agent makes money. So you all pull in yep. on the resources together? Yeah, we pull wow. in on the resources. Everybody on the team has access to the transaction coordinator. The mm -hmm. admin handles all the paperwork, things like that. And you have a team lead that's there to mentor you, to walk you through the deals and everything like that. How many people in your team now? We got 15 now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So are you planning to grow your team any bigger or are you like, ah, oh, kind of? Yeah, actually I am. Mm -hmm. Actually, I am. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that people get into real estate for their different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to put my passion onto them. Mm -hmm. So I do have like an interview process, but life usually jumps in the way. Right. So I have some agents that are extremely productive mm -hmm. and they got the fire and desire and they're mm -hmm. going, going, going. But then I have some that life has just came in right. and they're on the heart. And mm -hmm. they're in a hole. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I feel like I could bring more agency and still give them the time. This the pipeline. Time. You got to yeah. always keep that pipeline moving. Yeah, keep moving. the pipeline moving. Yeah. So what makes a good person to be on your team? Who's interested in real estate, number one. And they'll show their interest because they got to pass the test. Okay. So once they pass the test, then I like to just see what kind of people person they are. Because mm -hmm. real estate is a people person business. Mm -hmm. not, you know, you got to be charismatic and be able to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. People got to like you in order to do business with right. you. Right. That's number one. And then if you have fire, the passion, and I always ask you about like, what's your why? Mm. Why did you get into real estate? Mm -hmm. If it's to make a couple dollars, get a mm -hmm. new car, this, mm -hmm. that, and other. Mm -hmm. Once you get the car, then what? Right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. But like my why is to leave a legacy, do something that hasn't been done before. And that's what, you know, my why is. Mm -hmm. So what I really hone into is to try to find out what's your why. Mm -hmm. Does your why correlate with my why? Because I'm going to be pouring myself mm -hmm. into you, mm -hmm. so I don't want to waste my time. How come you didn't start your own brokerage, or that's something down the road you consider? It's something down the road I consider. You can start catching pennies, but it, it costs a lot to, to have your own brokerage. I've been asked that question a lot. Uh, with your success, why not start your own black brokerage? Mm -hmm. And what I said is, Keller Williams is a huge name. Don't pigeonhole, just put yourself in a box, man. Don't put myself in a box and lose box. all the resources lose, that you get. That I have. And it's really screwed up for black businesses oh, like yeah. that. Is because you don't want to be the black realtor. Mm -hmm. Because if you become the black brokerage, you won't get nothing but the black business. Yeah. That's all you'll get because people will say, oh, that's the black brokers. You mm -hmm. run out there and that's what it's saying. And fine, you'll say, well, let me just take the black business. But right. you don't want that because nobody else do that. White folks don't say I'm the white broker. Right. You, <laughs> you know, it, you hit it you, right on the head. And it's messed up that we have to be like that. And, and the sad thing about it, I've had people tell me, like, as my circle started expanding, mm -hmm. I've had interviews and went on listing appointments, affluent black people in the mm -hmm. communities like, well, I didn't know a black realtor could handle a sale of this magnitude. Oh, that, that I don't even give me stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> hold on, what would you say? Like, right, what, right. what's the difference between this house? Right. Yeah, it's a right. little bit more. <laughs> but it's all paperwork. It's all paperwork. <laughs> but I've had those. And then on the other end, I've had people who are looking to sell their house in mm -hmm. an affluent area and mm -hmm. looking for a black realtor and then felt that. They couldn't find anyone mm. that was worthy pretty much wow. enough to sell their property. Wow. So it's still struggles for me mm -hmm. as well, getting into a higher price point. Like right now I do a quantity of deals. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing a hundred some deals on my own without a transaction coordinator, without mm -hmm. a sales agent or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I was doing them on quantity. Okay. So house per sale might've been like 60 K, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but now I'm trying to raise that price point up. And it's a struggle. It's a big struggle in this city. Have you ran into some really racial things or something that made you really sit back and be like, wow, you want to oh. share with us, man? Oh, yeah. I'm going to tell you like this. I had a listing in North Royalty mm -hmm. and I took my sign out there and I put my sign and it had my face on it. Mm. I didn't get one call. Mm. Went, took the sign off. Took the face off. Took the face off. Sold the bad boy <laughs> two weeks later. It's sad. It's sad. I'm going like to tell you it. another story. Mm -hmm. My brother, he was flipping houses over in the Detroit Shoreway area. Okay. And everybody used to be like, Jermaine, why aren't you selling your brother's houses? Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, you guys just wouldn't understand. I had to list in one of his houses. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get nothing. I don't know if it was racial mm -hmm. or nothing, but a white agent ended up getting it. Did the same listing, mm -hmm. same description, and had a contract. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, I do see that. It's been times where... I've walked into a property showing it. Mm -hmm. And then another agent came up with their client to mm -hmm. show it. We're like, well, how did you guys get in? And I'm like, well, I got a 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> the lockbox code just right. like you. Right. Oh, uh, I didn't know you were the agent. You know, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Pretty much like, why are you in this right. area? Right. I've seen it all. I even got in trouble with the district on deals. And I told them, I really? said, it, it, see, it was a huge migration from minorities moving from like Cleveland Heights, South Euclid, Shaker, out to Twinsburg, Macedonia, Sagamore Hills. Really? We're going that way. Within the last Wait, like, five yeah, years. You know, yeah, there's a lot of people would say they we were moving out, out there now. in Twinsburg and yeah. places like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're pretty much all out there. And being that agent that was doing those, I told them when I got uh, so-called got in trouble, I was like, why every time I come out here to sell a house and put an offer in, I get a call to the commission. Hmm. I, said, I get a call. Every time I do a deal, I done did a hundred deals in the inner city and the suburbs, mm -hmm. no nothing. Hmm. But I go out here, price point 500, 450, wow. and then I get a call. Wow. And I mean, it, it is what it is. Uh, but that's the way I felt about mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. I've been putting some some rough it, situations. It's really rough. It's, yeah. it's still rough out here and trying to do what you do, but you keep it going. So, and that's a good yeah. thing. Let me ask you a question. I've been saying that a lot right. about the migration. What you see is happening in Cleveland, because one, we talk about, and like I do a little politics, so I measure things on the census and we measure stuff on vote turnout. Okay. And we know that the vote turnout in the inner city has done went down really low. And my theory, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or not from your standpoint, my theory is I told them, I don't believe the people actually live in the city no more. I, I think most of the black folks who could get out the city has left the city. They either migrated to the heights and places, like you said, the folks that were in the heights migrated out further. The other folks who was in the city migrated to the heights and out that way. And now we have this hub of inner city that there's no bodies there. I mean, you ride through these neighborhoods, they're empty. Vacant lots, the city tore down every house and everything that was there. So you have nothing but vacant lots. So I don't believe they're there. And, and then the migration that we do have is downtown Cleveland and going west. So what you say about that? I think you hit it right on the head. Just been a total evolution. My take on it, when the mortgage crisis happened, we got a lot of investors that came to the city. Mm -hmm. A lot of those investors started buying in the Maple Heights mm -hmm. area, except in CMHA. Okay. So now people who were in the inner city of Cleveland mm -hmm. going to Maple, yeah. and Euclid. Yep. Because they got high, high, even Warrensville has high CMHA mm -hmm. type voucher programs and mm -hmm. things like that. So mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the people from Cleveland went to. Mm -hmm. Now, those people that were in Maple Heights, Garfield, like that, they were already in those school districts. And what was happening during all that? It was the school levels yeah, not yeah. passing, schools right, were bad, right, this, right. that, and other. So everybody wanted to go to the Solons, mm. the Twinsburgs, the mm. Auroras, just based on the schools. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my clients were like, yes, I'm here, but I would like to go there for the schools. Wow. Period. And that's so funny, like on the MLS, you can ask like what area you want to be in. You send over all the houses in the area. For a while, I was just putting in the school district. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's all your concern is. People right. were like, yeah, my concern is the school district. Mm -hmm. And then you see that's where all those so-called good schools were mm -hmm. in those areas. So that's where a lot of people went. But as far as in Cleveland, yeah, a lot of the houses have been t torn down. Mm -hmm. uh, I studied that because when we got the NSP money through mm -hmm. President Barack, mm -hmm. to stabilize everything. A lot of our money in Cleveland went towards demolition. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you see whole streets right. being demo. Right. I don't know what that process was, mm -hmm. but that's where it leaves us where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. We got all these lots and what do you do with these lots? As far as the migration, and you got to think about it, um, ages. Mm -hmm. We was having this conversation a while back, like in Warrensville. Warrensville housing population is small because they got a lot of apartments. Okay. They got a gang of apartments. Yes, they, they do. They got Granada, yeah. the right. Elbridge, yeah. the Bam Bear, you mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. they got a, a gang of apartments, mm -hmm. take the CMHA vouchers, things like that, mm -hmm. which makes it more of a transient community. Okay. All the houses, mm -hmm. people, I graduated in 93. So a lot of my friends' parents still stay in still those there. original okay. houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's no inventory for no inventory. people. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know what? The Warrensville houses are typical for the older yep. person because Branches. they're small. And Warrensville really is not a bad place to be oh, no, no, no. A, a, at all, you know. But let's go in a little bit with that. You see those trends is why the crime and everything else is kind of like Euclid now. It seems to be a hotbed. And those places, because of that, you know, I told those people done just migrated out. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely see a trend with that. Mm -hmm. I don't 
think that that's the whole issue. Okay. I think it's a lot of underlying issues. Well, me and my friends were talking and I'm 46. So when we were growing up, we had bullies when we were growing up. Correct. It's wild to say this, but somewhat bullies kept the neighborhood intact. <laughs> right. Like you would not go test, but so much. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because right. such and such, he taking my fries from right. my right. Exactly. But they kept some type of demographic. Mm-hmm. All of those guys, when we were growing up, all went to jail because, you know, the dope game was right. all good. So right. all of them went to jail. So we had a whole population of guys who were mentors, mm-hmm. whatever, go to jail. And that just left a huge gap. Mm-hmm. And I think we're still recovering from that as far as mentoring was in the homes mm-hmm. like that. Oh yeah, no, that that killed it and then yeah. crack cocaine yeah. and all yeah. of that. Yeah. You know, it really tore us up a lot. Well, let's let's go to this because you got a whole lot to unpack. Mm-hmm. And, and I want to talk about the development piece. Okay. You hear people, oh, look at all this stuff they built on Detroit Shore Way and all of this, and they built this on the west side. They're not building nothing on the east side. Mm-hmm. And I told her is because they don't plan. Right. There's no plans to build anything. Nobody walked over there on Detroit Shore Way and said, hey, I don't care how much money you got. Right. You can't build that in one year. Right. You can't build that in two years. Right. First of all, the city of Cleveland permitting department will take you a year to get a damn permit out of there. So just in that whole process, it takes time in the planning process and everything to get things done like that. Right. And so with that, I want to talk about what sparked you into doing development. So what do you see yourself doing with development? So WRJ developers started through high school friend, Willie Levy. Okay. Willie Levy graduated from Warrensville in 93, went to Morgan State. Mm-hmm. And Will had came back and was buying houses here and there. Mm-hmm. And our other friend, Richard Singleton, all of us been knowing each other since like fourth grade. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard was doing his projects as well. He was buying from the land bank, and them up and them out. And then I was doing my thing. But Willie challenged us. Okay. He was like, Jermaine, I see how many people you done help. One investor, he bought all of this. Like, he was just watching me. Mm-hmm. And he was like, we need to do something for ourselves. Like, what are you talking about, Will? He was like, we need to pool our resources. If me, you, and Rich came together, since we love real estate, we're in real estate, but we're all working in silos. If we mm-hmm. start working together, like we did down in Baltimore, we can get more bang for our buck. Mm-hmm. And that's what it started as. It started as that. And then Willie was like, all the projects, you know, the whole lay of the land in the city. You know what's going on here. You know what's going on there. Let's just put together a project. And then I believe things happen for a reason. I believe in karma and things mm-hmm. like that. After we had that conversation, I helped a guy out buy a house. He was a veteran, had a VA loan. He was staying off 61st in Wade Park, mm-hmm. and he wanted to move to Garfield. I helped him with that transition, and then he was like, I got this little house down there, and it was falling apart, and this, that, and other. I just want to get rid of it. So I rode down there, and when I looked at it, I seen all the lots that they had demoed houses. Mm. I seen opportunity. I was like, wow, this is a great area. So I called Will. I was like, how quick y'all want to start this development? Mm. Will flew in town that next weekend. Mm. Him and Rich drove around. We went to that one house. Mm -hmm. And I was like, look at this house and look at what's surrounding it. And they were like, what you talking about? We just, you know, we're talking about renovating. I was like, look, something has to happen with all of these lots. And we need to come up with a plan we come up with a plan in which we could take this one house, mm-hmm. but make multiple houses or multiple things in this area, we can uplift the whole community. Mm-hmm. And I said, that would be the win. And that's what started WRJ Development. Hmm. And so from that standpoint, you guys decided that you wanted to get into development because I guess you were going to actually yeah, build something yeah, we're up. from the ground, ground up. up. Yeah. yeah. And the first time we went down to city planning, Mm -hmm. we walked in with this, oh, wow, it was embarrassing now. We walked in, we had the little site map with Mm -hmm. all the parcels and everything like that. We had the one little house that we had bought Mm -hmm. and we had drew little squares. This is going to be this house. (laughs) (laughs) We went down there and luckily the lady, she was like, look, I like you guys' enthusiasm, Mm -hmm. uh, but this is what you need to do. Okay. She said, there's a huge difference between somebody who's renovating a property, Mm -hmm. somebody with a vision and strategic planning and understands what the community needs. Mm -hmm. That's a developer. So she set us down and actually told us. And then from there, we really started looking at things okay. on a higher level. Like if we build 40 homes here, what's the transportation? Mm-hmm. What's the closest grocery store? What's this? What's around? What's surrounding this community? Is it a walkable area? You know, we start looking at things like that. Mm-hmm. And then that's how we put together the first project we put together. They got approved. And then from there, that's when we pivoted 
to what we're building right now on 72nd and St. Clair. So we're doing a, a container apartment building on 72nd, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. 64 units right on 72nd and St. Clair, right down the street from Gordon Park right by Angela's and Route 2. And then right behind there, we work with the city, put together a strategic plan. So it's a total of 58 lots Mm -hmm. from 73rd all the way to 76, in which we're doing infill development. And we're building two family houses, two family and three family houses made out of shipping containers all the way back. So all of these will be shipping container homes? Yeah, for this development, yes. So what made you pick shipping containers? Because we took the numbers to a gang of contractors, Mm -hmm. like all the big guys. and the numbers didn't pencil out. Like in order for you to get funding, everything has to pencil out, Look, going through your performer and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Everything has to be at a certain rate in order for you to even consider being funding. After we added on the contractor's fee, this 10% for this, mm-hmm. 30% for this, mm-hmm. this 20% mm-hmm. in their net profit. Correct. It was ridiculous. Like we couldn't compete. So then we started looking for like a product. Like all of us come from renovations. Mm-hmm. We've been 50 billion of them. So we were like, once we get the structure here, then that's our wheelhouse. We can Mm -hmm. take over. And we started just looking up things. And then we found the shipping container projects. We started traveling around. We went to Nashville, went to Detroit, went to Vegas. We just started traveling, put an eye on it and seeing it. And was like, this is feasible. Really? Yeah, it could be done. The closest thing I can think of is what they got over on Kinsman. Kinsman, box spot. By spot. Yep. So you're talking something similar to that. Yep. So after we started doing our research, we actually reached out to a development company who did box mm-hmm. spot, mm-hmm. found the architect, Adam. So we started talking with Adam. There was a container building yeah, show that right. came on HTV mm-hmm. and come to find out they were based out of Detroit. Mm. Squared. Really? And I was like, oh, I know exactly where Corktown is. Mm-hmm. So I drove up there, went to their motto and they had put like 15 in the dirt. At that point in time hmm. and they had the blueprint this that, another so we just started learning 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 and once so, we start learning it was like this can be done so is it one container or are they two containers side by side all right so the apartment building is sort of complex but mm-hmm. the thing the beauty about containers is that they're like little rubik's cubes little legos so it's actually the two family is a total of six containers okay all right so you just imagine your two end containers mm-hmm. you take out the uh, left wall on the left one, you mm-hmm. take out the right wall on the other one. The middle container, you take out both walls. So you actually you just put them together. <laughs> okay. Get them all the way over. I'm thinking container, container. No. Uh-huh. Y'all open it. Okay. You open it up. Okay. And then, uh, like, our, um, so. Well, I guess you picked that container because it is more durable, more sustainable. Is yeah, that. So it's several reasons. Uh, sustainability of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the biggest issues, like people who renovate houses, you know, what's the two things you first look at? The mm-hmm. roof and the foundation. Mm-hmm. Okay. So with the containers, we were moving the roof. Okay. There's no roofing issues. And then as far as the structure, there's no basement. We're built slab on the ground. Slab on the ground. Yeah. But you, you got to put a roof on top, right? Nope. Oh, we got um, no. on the ones we're building, we're doing straight flat roofs. Straight flat so, roofs. Yep. So the height of the house is the type of the container. Correct. Are they stacked top to top? So you have up and downstairs? Yeah, up and downstairs. Really? Yeah, so doing the two families. We chose the two families because just from my experience, type families, everybody love them. Mm-hmm. And then within like the last two, three years, house hacking has become like right. huge. And house hacking is when you stay on one floor, you run out the other one, and it gives people, you know, the sense of pride, of right. home ownership, mm-hmm. and you become an investor at the mm-hmm. same time. Okay. So that was our whole vision. Let's just build two families. We got a gang of people, a, a lot of young people that want to come in, purchase one. They're going to stay in the first floor, rent it out. They leave. They rent out both units. So mm-hmm. it just gives options for people. So how much will these container houses kind of run? So right now we're on our performer. We're at about 350K to build them. Mm-hmm. We're going to be renting them out. We're keeping and holding everything as of right now. Oh, so you're not selling. You, no, these are all going to be rental units. These are all going to be rental units. So that's a total. How many units? It'll be a total of 64. And it's over 130 rentable units that we'll have in that area from oh. 72nd to 76. So are your company going to manage those? No, uh, we're actually going to be looking for companies to manage. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing about the development that a lot of people don't understand is that as a new developer, whether you're black, white or whatever, as a new developer, it costs a lot of money. 
Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the main focus of the developer is to pay for it's everything. To pay for everything up front. <laughs> up front. Yeah, right. we, we didn't Google that yeah, when we yeah. started. <laughs> right. We, I, think, we start. I think they buried that in like definition C. Right. right, right. <laughs> so you pretty much front all the money. Oh, and yeah. They hope you get it back. By the way, you got to pay for everything. Yeah. <laughs> so our whole thing is that we'll get everything up and rent it. Then we're looking for, like I said, a property manager, because one thing we realize is that you can't do it all on your own. No, that's great. Uh, so we started talking to banks and we mm -hmm. were getting no, no, mm -hmm. no, no, mm -hmm. no. So what we started doing was every time somebody said no, why did they say no? Right. So then we started going back and figuring out. So for the apartment building and discussions and we talked and it got passed by their board for them to be 20% partner, mm -hmm. co-developer on the apartment building. The bank. For Nico's foundation. The community development center and then they also have a property management arm mm -hmm. as well so we were thinking about that to be a way for us to support the community development center they'd be the property manager they're in a the community they mm -hmm. understand the community and they are already doing it i recreate the wheel when they're doing it that was what our thoughts was so one of the reasons why i had you come on the show was that my daughter kennedy she was part of a development program and she was like yeah it's a guy he owns some property in glenville and doing this and i was like oh whatever you know and then she said no he got some real property he's doing it. i said okay i'm thinking you know god picked up a couple of lots so she kept trying to get me to come to one of these meetings so i finally came and looked and she said, there he is right there right. so tell me about that program with you i thought that was a really good program and good for you guys to do and did you get any takeaways from that yeah i actually did when we first started coming down the pipeline presenting the city planning and everything like mm -hmm. that we got a lot of community organizations reaching out to us mm -hmm. asking us what resources do we have what are we needing mm -hmm. as minority developers what's the deficit what's the hurdles what's mm -hmm. this we just start telling them like we need this we need that and it was almost like as embarrassing as it sounds it was like the city wasn't ready mm -hmm. for a minority developer to come no, out. I, really um so they when they reached out they were saying what well, this is the program the ready program that we already have in place mm -hmm. so we looked at the curriculum and was like all right well what about if we could share this experience or every pitfall that we already stepped in and landmine that we already right. grew up on right. let's not have other people do that so it was just us reaching back trying to grab some others because the east side is wide wide open oh yeah a lot of us are from the east side mm -hmm. and it was just just to give back pretty much no it's a good but program yes yeah, it's, it's a great program and it, the biggest thing i like about the program is bringing awareness okay is bringing awareness that there are some anxious people that are eager and have the mind state to develop, understand the landscape, understand the work that needs to go and have the vision to do it. Mm -hmm. And we need to support it. The city needs to be supported. After the program, like nationwide, there's programs that help small developers and minority mm -hmm. developers that after you finish the program, you have access to capital. Right. Okay. That's the other thing. Like we're pitching the banks mm -hmm. and banks are like, yeah, but we, nah, yeah, mm -hmm. we've been told the project's too small. Right. Yeah. You got to have a, ask for over 5 million, this, that, and other. Oh, even if you, even if the project, you know, pencils out, mm -hmm. this is your first development. So oh, you can't be lending right. that, you know, it's all of these first, first, first. Well, how do you get that first one under your belt? And the way we approached it was, you know what? We're going to build the first one out of our own pocket, cash out of hand. And then you have no reason to say we can't do it. They almost force you to yes. take on partners that you don't want. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and we've, we've had several conversations with some big key people, developers in the city where they're like, yes, we love the project. We love the area. We see the vision. You guys did it all the hard work, mm -hmm. market study, mm -hmm. soil samples surveys mm -hmm. we did all of that and then they said well we can take you across the finish line we'll go to the bank and help with the financing but we need 90 <laughs> percent <laughs> they don't want the piece right. of the pie they we say need, give me the pie we need 90 <laughs> percent goodness gracious give me the so, pie yeah so that's that's yeah. our biggest hurdle right uh -huh. there is just having the capacity to not inch along one at a time two at a time mm -hmm. so we're having conversations now with possibly opening the door to sell equity of the company, the partner wow. on that level, like that, because we understand that in order for us to scale as a company, we need that assistance. You need that assistance. Yeah. And it was a hard pill to swallow. It was mm -hmm. a hard pill to swallow. Like why, if it was my vision, it was our project, we putting this together for the legacy of our family. Why do we have to 
give up half in order for it to be successful. So let me ask you a question on this one too, mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to banking, because you talked about that. Right. Banking in Cleveland, I'm working on a couple of projects downtown mm -hmm. and the developer I'm working with, he says that you can't get a commercial loan in the city of Cleveland. He said the banks are not loaning. He had to actually use a Huntington bank and he went outside of Cleveland. He's a developer, been in the town, doing business here for years and everything else. But he says that you can't borrow. It's hard to borrow bank money in the city of Cleveland. Now I imagine based off of what you're trying to do with the redlining and everything else that's been going on in this right. town for years, it's got to be difficult for you to get financing for this thing. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, definitely. That's been our biggest obstacle. First, you got to find a bank that's willing to lend, mm -hmm. number one. Second, you got to find a bank that's willing to lend to a new developer. Wow. Third, you got to find a bank that's willing to lend to someone who does not have a million liquid mm. to a person who guarantee it. <laughs> That part. That part. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. So we, we've had talks with a lot mm -hmm. of the banks. One thing that we have been able to narrow down is that there are some smaller institutions mm -hmm. that have a CRA money okay. that are willing to put into projects like mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. uh, and even partner with you as you grow. So that's what we just started focusing on. Mm -hmm. That We've had some talks within like the last two months mm -hmm. with private equity firms that mm -hmm. are in Cleveland. Okay. That are willing to lend money towards mm -hmm. the project. Oh, yeah. We knocked on all those doors and a lot of the bigger banks were just like, no, but it's not no because we don't like the project. Right. It's no because you don't meet the qualifications. The and then uh, we, our biggest thing was, how are we going to meet the qualifications? Mm -hmm. Everybody keep telling us no. Right. They keep moving the goalposts. They keep, keep moving keep it. Moving. Keep moving it. Keep yeah. moving it. That's their thing. Yeah, but there are some institutions. Uh, Erie Bank. Okay. Erie Bank, we've had some great conversations with Erie Bank, mm -hmm. uh, First Premier Bank, mm -hmm. Savista. Okay. Th they've been, you know, apt mm -hmm. and, and actually work with us. Like, okay. look, let's try to see how we can do this. And how much is the total project? When you finish, you think? The actual apartment building is uh, 13 mil. Mm -hmm. uh, and then each one of the duplexes is penciled at 350 per duplex. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've been like doing a lot of value engineering on the first one. That's our little baby. So we're cutting there like, little simple stuff like we found out that all our windows were custom order mm. and if we would have changed them one inch each direction they would have been factory factory wow that was a nine thousand dollars nine thousand dollars switch <laughs> the foundations that we put in first are the elliptical piers okay that we put in per our architect and our engineer we found out that if we just did a straight wall foundation wall it's a little bit cheaper okay so we changing that on our plans and everything like that so we've been like value engineering as we go. So our goal number is if we can build these around 250 to 275, mm -hmm. which is like 125 per unit, that's where we really want to be. Did the city offer you any help? But I heard you say tax abatement. So you yeah, gonna... so we got we got the tax abatement. Mm -hmm. uh, actually got a, a grant through economic development, a risable grant. So we okay. had to spend the money to get it back. But okay. we got that for soft costs. Mm -hmm. Working with community development advisors as well for a soft cost grant or loan for them to build more at one time. And then uh, city councilman, Councilman Harrison, he's been okay. extremely helpful yeah. okay. with anything that the city has to offer. He's fighting a good fight now. Hopefully we can mm -hmm. get some of those ARPA dollars yeah. for the project because that area hasn't seen any investment mm -hmm. in decades. That's true. In decades. That's true. So hopefully we can get that. If we can get that, then that's the extra push that we need to make it come to fruition all the way. Excellent, man. Oh, hey, man. I really appreciate you coming on our show, man. I'm you, glad, you, glad to be you, here. You dropped a lot of good, valuable information to people who are willing to listen and, and go from there. And if you want to get more information about what Mr. Brooks is doing, you can check our description below and we're going to leave links to his website, his Facebook accounts, all okay. this stuff for what he's doing and how you can get in touch with him. We end our program, man, by giving you the opportunity to talk to our millions and millions of listeners and people watching us out there. Then tell them what Mr. Brooks and what you guys are doing at your company. If there's something you want, if there's property you want to talk to them about, any of that, the camera's yours, man. Take as long as you want. If you're looking to list, sell, or buy a property, feel free to reach out to me. Jermaine Brooks. I'm at 216-224-4326. He'll also have a link. And if you have any questions or want to be a part of our development, feel free to reach out to me as well. We are looking for community partners, people of color who are interested in investing or possibly learning feel free to reach out. We're here. It's trying to start a movement in the area. It's not for us. We're trying to build something for the community. Our biggest thing is for our community, by our community. So that's our thing. 
All right. Mr. Brooks, you can check out, like I said, look in the description. You will see everything that you need to get from Mr. Jermaine Brooks right on our website. And we'll see you next Sunday.